Hello, congregation and family and friends. Thank you for joining me on this edition of Bible Talk. I posed what I think is an interesting question this week as I've been thinking about a topic for this week. And the question is this. Does Satan, does Satan have a plan to bring us down? In his workings, in his manipulations, is there a plan? Is there a formula that he uses to get people to fall? And essentially, his goal is this. We know that Satan's goal is to take as many people to hell with him as possible. That is his goal. We know that. Satan already knows that he is condemned forever. He already knows that he will be spending eternity in a pit of fire that will never go out. Him and all of his demonic angels and everyone else who chooses to go there, who chooses to reject Jesus as Savior. Those who die in this world without Christ and have never made a full confession that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. Since we know Jesus is the only way to heaven, if you don't confess Jesus and you don't have him, there's only one other place you can go. But to Satan have a plan, a blueprint, a, a battle plan that he uses. And I say, yes, he does. He has a strategy. And we see it at the, in his very first appearance in the Bible. It's what I call the three Ds. The three Ds. That is doubt, denial, and denigration. And we're going to go over all of those tonight on Bible Talk. So I hope you'll find this uh, talk interesting and that you'll interact with me. My main text is Genesis 3. Now, at the end of Genesis 2, you know, uh, God had created everything, and Adam and Eve were there, and really, when you think about it, it's the last time there was actually peace on earth, if you think about it, because sin had not entered the world yet. And at the end of Genesis 2, it says that Adam and Eve, they were both naked, the man and his wife, they were not ashamed. Everything was working the way God originally created it. There was harmony between animals and human beings. Everything that God created, he said, was very good. But then we get into Genesis 3, and of course, using the serpent, Satan makes his first appearance. And here is where I will show you where what I call the three Ds are. And that is doubting, denial, and denigration. This is Satan's strategy. This is his formula, and he does it over and over again. Watch what happens. When we go to Genesis 3, verse 1, we read this. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Okay? The word subtle just means cunning or crafty. And he said unto the woman, that would be Eve, of course, Yea, has God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Doubt. Now we know from reading the earlier chapters of Genesis that God was very, very clear. He said, you can eat of every tree in the garden, but of this one tree you cannot eat. You're not allowed to do that. So the first thing that Satan does, good evening, Tawana. The first thing that Satan does is he puts doubt in Eve's mind. Did God really, are you sure that God really said that? Are you absolutely certain? He says, yea, has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Doubt. See, the minute we have doubt in our mind, we start questioning things. And no matter where your level of faith is, if doubt starts creeping into your mind, you start questioning things that you thought maybe were rock solid. It's just, it's just human, it's a flaw that we have in, in, in human nature. We doubt things. When we don't, we can look at something and if somebody says, no, the sky is not blue today, there'll be a certain percentage of us will say, you know what, the sky isn't blue today. You're right. Just like that, doubt has fallen into our mind. And so the first thing that crafty old Satan is going to do in his strategy is put doubt in our mind. And what he's doing here is he's doubting the word of God. God said, you may eat of all the trees, but of this one tree you may not eat. But then Satan says, are you sure that's what God said? Are you certain about that? Has God really said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now look what happens. Eve, beginning in verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. So far, so good. But of the free, fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, 
neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. You see what happened there? Eve misquoted what God said. She added something to God's command. She said, we're not allowed to eat of it, but we're not allowed to touch it. Now you see, here's what doubt does. Here's what Satan does. He comes in and he says, wait a minute, did God really say that? And then we repeat back to him or we start thinking, God, did you really, wait a minute, did you really mean this in the Bible? Did you really mean that in the Bible? Well, maybe that's not what God was talking about. Immediately, immediately. Now, now we're messed up. So that's step one of Satan's strategy, putting doubt. But then it goes on. Verse four. Now this is after the serpent heard Eve misquote God. Verse four. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. That's denial. That's the second step. First step was doubting the word of God. Did God really say that? And the second is God, God, you're not going to really die. God didn't really say that. Put denial in your mind. So now, first of all, you're already reeling from doubt. Is that really what God said? Maybe I am misinterpreted the Bible. Maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this or doing that. Then the second step is Satan puts in complete denial. God said you would surely die. That is a fact. God stated it, which means it's a truth. Satan comes along and he says, no, God's wrong. You're not going to die. You're not going to die. So if, if we as gullible, vulnerable human beings were to hear Satan say, you know what? God said that you're going to die and you're going to wind up in the lake of fire if you don't accept Christ. God didn't really say that. So don't worry about it. Live the way you want. Do whatever you want. You don't have to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is what denial does to you. Just flat out deny what God has said. And so that's the second step that we see. He puts doubt in our mind and then he throws complete and utter denial of the word of God. We need to be careful about that. That's the second step. Then in the third step, he does what I call denigration. Denigration is simply attacking, belittling, making light of. He is now actually, it's not just bad enough to attack the word of God. He is going to attack God himself here. Look what he says in verse five. For God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see what he did there? You can be like God. You can be God yourself. You can know good and evil. You can know everything. Why? Because your eyes will be open. That's denigration. That is, that, is, that is trying to put human beings on a par with Almighty God. How dare we? How dare any of us even think we're anywhere? We are not gods. We're human beings. But you see, once you put doubt in someone's mind, and then you deny the very word of God, now you can twist and you can manipulate in any way you want because now you can come in for the kill. Now you can come in and say, oh no. First of all, God didn't really say that. Second of all, you can't really trust his word. And now you can be like God himself. You can be like God himself. Listen, would somebody do this? Um, look up John 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. So one of you who was on here tonight, and if you would just post that up. I, I like to address that verse. John chapter 8, verse 44. If one of you could do that. Thank you. So now we have three steps. Doubt, denial, denigration. How do you combat something like that? See, that's Satan's strategy. And if you think about it, if you think about it, Hasn't he done that in your life too? I know he did it in my life. <laughs> when I was a young Christian, I was just reading the Bible. Um, uh, they would they would have those, and I still, Satan still attacks. He'll put something in my mind and say, no, did God, did God really say that? Does he, I mean, are you interpreting this passage right, Thomas? Are you sure that you understand what God is saying? Does he really mean what he says? Is there really a place called hell, that people who reject Christ, how could a loving God do that? God's not going to, no, 
there's all kinds of things. You see where I'm driving at? Wherever you are in your walk with God, wherever you are, don't let these three things happen to you. Doubt, denial, and denigration. Don't ever, ever let that happen because you'll see what happened with Adam and Eve. Look verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and did eat and gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of them both were opened, and Satan did say that, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves aprons, and so on. Then God shows up in the garden. He says, where are you? What are you doing? Then you see that whole ball rolling. Well, we were, we were hiding from you. At the end of chapter 2, they were naked. They were not ashamed. Here, all of a sudden, they realized they were naked. Their eyes were open. They realized they had sinned. They had fell. And Satan is laughing all the way to the bank, as they say. He got them. Don't let them get you the same way. And I want to share something else with you, too. When we... How do I want to say this? Not everyone that comes into your life, I'm just going to say this. Not everyone that comes into your life is well-meaning. Not everyone in your life wishes you good. There are many people that you want to run across in your life and in this world that want harm for you. And, and the ones that hurt the most, are not, they're not the ones that are uh, not believers. Because we can... We can witness to them. We can pray for them. It's the people that are believers. It's the people that profess Christ that come at you and attack you. And they use this same strategy. Let me give you an example. And I'll bet you you've, you've had people like this in your life before. Do, do you think <laughs> it's not an accident why there's so many denominations and so many churches around? It's because people start doubting what the word of God says. Satan starts working on people. And he says, no, you need to go in this direction. Or no, you need to go in that direction. That's why there's so many cults around. So many false churches and so many people that are falling into it. It has to do with, first of all, doubting the word of God. And then denying what God says. And then denigrating God. You've heard of the New Age movement, right? One of the main precepts of the New Age movement is that we can be gods. We're gods. God's inside of us. We understand that as Christians, that God, the Holy Spirit, dwells within us. Our bodies are the temple of the Lord. We understand that. But it goes in a whole different way when the New Agers say, we are gods. No, we are not. We're human beings. We are fallible, sin-cursed human beings. And the only way out of that is to stand on the word of God. Did someone find John 8, 44? I guess not. You know what? I want to go to that because I want to show you an attribute, something that Satan... And this is what we have to be careful of. And I do want to get back to my point I was making before of people who come into your life and they'll use these same three things. Think about it. Some of you will say, you know, I was, I was reading the Bible and... I just don't believe what he says. I think the Bible's a fairy tale. I think the Bible was written by a bunch of guys, but it was not the word of God. You see, right away, denial. Oh, I don't, you know what? I believe in the Big Bang Theory or something else. I don't believe God spoke the universe into being. Denigration. Are you, sh are you sure that, um, that once we're married, God, God frowns on divorce? Are, are you sure about that? Hmm, doubt. See, the only way to fortify ourselves against any of this, to stop against the lies, to stop against all this, the only way out is to know the word of God for ourselves. And so when those doubters come to us and those deniers come to us and those people that want to be little and not God or even say they don't believe in him, we need to know this book. We need to know it as best we can so that we can make an argument against them and we can say, no, you are wrong. Here's one of the verses that I wanted to look at. It's John chapter 8, verse 44. Now, now, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he says this in amongst this whole discourse. He says in verse 44, Ye are of the Father, the devil, and the lusts of your fathers you will do. 
He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Do you hear that? There's no truth in Satan. Zero. Nothing. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Are you hearing me? Satan is the father of lies. What he did to Eve all the way back in the beginning, the first thing he ever said in the Bible was a lie. He put doubt in her mind by asking a question, but it was a lie. Satan is a liar. Satan is a liar. We, as true born-again believers, want nothing and should have nothing to do with Satan. And I got news for you. We are going to run across quite a few people in our life in our walk with Christ, particularly the more we walk with Christ, the more faithful we are, the more we want to be Christ-like, the more we study the Word, you will find, and I have found, that people will come against you. They will do anything they can to knock you off the path of righteousness. Just because we're born-again believers does not mean that we're better than anyone else that we deserve more favor than anyone else, that God smiles down upon us more than anyone else. That's not what that means. We are saved by grace. It, it, it is Jesus that died on the cross who paid for the sins of every single person that would believe on him. Every person that would place their trust in him. Yes, that's right. He is the father of lies. That's right. And so if he's the father of lies... Everyone who follows Satan, everyone who denies Jesus, is a liar also. Because they don't have the truth in them. And they will do whatever they can to get you off your path. Anybody have that experience, even recently or somewhere in your life, where maybe there was someone that professed themselves to be a Christian. And yet, they, they, they start doubting the Word of God. And it's... It can start really simple. It can start really insidious. I'll show you where a place that, that is really a problem. And it's happening right in front of our eyes. And I think a lot of people aren't catching on to it. So let me share this with you. There are so many Bible translations out. Okay. Now this is, this is a topic really for another time. But I just want to interject it to show you how insidious Satan works. There are Bible versions out. Yes, some are easier to read than others. I understand that. I understand that not everyone understands or accepts King James English or has an issue with it. What I'm saying is, I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm old enough to remember this. Do any of you remember uh, a Bible that came out years ago called the Reader's Digest Bible? This, was, this has to be 30, 40 years ago, showing my age. The Reader's Digest Bible. Do you know what it was? There was a group of scholars that got together and decided that they were going to condense the Bible into what they felt was the most important sections. They took the Word of God and they chopped it all up. And when you saw the Reader's Digest Bible, it was a fraction of what a Bible is supposed to be. There wasn't 66 books in it. There was bits and pieces and some arbitrary group of editors and experts decided what was important from the Word of God and what wasn't. That that is Satan. That is Satan. You are doubting the Word of God, so you make a decision uh, that I'm just going to rub out some of this. Not all this is the Word of God. Then you are going to say, well, I'm going to deny that this is the Word of God, so I'm going to cut this out too, and I'm going to denigrate. I know as much as God, so I can edit his book. You see how insidious that is? Do you, now that was blatant, and I got news for you. For those of you who don't remember it, it wasn't out on the bookshelves very long. It was a colossal failure. People were up in arms to say, how dare you condense this? And you understand Reader's Digest, when they used to put out their books, they would, they would take a novel and they would chop it down. So Reader's Digest was meant to be read in small sections. How dare they do that with the Bible? You've got to be kidding. That was all the work of Satan. All the work of Satan. And so what I'm saying about Bible translations, even today, you can go into any bookstore or go online and you can see dozens of translations. Does that mean all of them are accurate? No. Does it mean all of them are the Word of God? Some people would argue yes. Some people would argue no. I say no because there are some 
versions, not as bad as the Reader's Digest, but there are some versions that blatantly cut out passages and cut out scriptures that are in other versions. As I said, this is a subject that we could talk about another time because there's arguments on both sides. The point is that the minute Satan can get a foothold in your life or my life, the publishing industry, the music industry, the entertainment industry, he is the prince of the air of this world. Uh, and that's part of the reason God is going to destroy this world and rebuild it. Once Satan and all of his imps and all of his angels that are fallen and every single person that ever denied Christ, once they're all gone, then there's a new heaven and a new earth. We won't have to worry about Satan pulling his strategy on us. So I, I want to encourage you tonight as you know those who are watching, and I thank you all for being a part of this, and please feel free to comment. I mean, this is this is open Bible talk, so you can certainly comment or ask a question or share a scripture, whatever you'd like to do. I um, like to be mindful of our time, so we're going to be here, you know, for another uh, five, six minutes, I guess, as the Spirit leads. But I want to encourage you, be careful of the signs. Be careful of the signs. It won't always be as as blatant as the encounter with Eve was. I mean, he just got right in her face. He got right in her face and he said, oh, okay, God didn't say this. He's lying. You can be just like God. And they fell. Sometimes it can be really, really subtle. Sometimes it can be... How do I want to say this? Not all of us, not all of us, um, very few of us are really well versed in scripture. So it's real easy to hear a pastor or a preacher, a Bible teacher, or attend the church, and it sounds good. And something I've always told my congregations and those I, I minister to over the years, don't trust me or any other preacher or any Bible teacher. You look it up for yourself and see if what you're being told is the truth. Because there is a lot of bad doctrine out there. There's a lot of bad teaching. There's a lot of teaching and doctrines and, and churches and cults. And they're sending people right to hell. Now that, again, that's another topic for another time. and Maybe we can get into that. The best defense against Satan's onslaught is to understand the word of God as best as you can. And if you don't understand something, ask someone who does. Don't just accept somebody's word for it and say, thus saith the Lord. And then later on, you go and read it and say, God never said that. That's what Satan did. Did God really say that? Know it for yourself. If there's anything that I can share with you, if there's anything that I would plead with you, is spend time in God's word every single day. That is your fortification. That is your, God is called a strong tower. That is your strong tower. That is your fortification against Satan and all of his fiery darts and all of his imps that are coming at you. And all the people that are going to come at you with false doctrine, false truth, denial, big bang theories, all this kind of nonsense that's going on. There is one truth. God's truth. You either accept it or you don't. But if you accept it, you owe it to yourself. Please, you owe it to yourself. Study the word for yourself. Make sure that you're not the next victim like Eve or somebody says something to you. Did God really say that? And you just accept it. And then you fall. And then it takes you even, even longer to get up out of the hole, if you ever get up. Some people go into a godless eternity because they believe the wrong thing. I know people right now that have denied Christ. I knew people who passed away, who left this world without knowing Jesus. My heart breaks for them. Now, I'm not, I'm not God. I'm not the final judge. But they never lived their life as a Christian or living. You didn't see fruit in their life. You didn't see any of the evidences that Jesus tells us that you're going to see. You didn't see any of it. Um, don't let that be you. Don't let Satan use his strategy on you. Don't let somebody look at, make sure you have the signs. If somebody, let's go over them again before we close out. If somebody ever doubts the word of God, that's a red flag. If someone ever denies the word of God, says it's not true, red flag. 
if someone ever denigrates or brings down in any way, shape, or form Almighty God Himself, red flag. You cannot let, you need to stand on the Word of God and you need to stop that nonsense right in its tracks. Because if you don't, it's like a disease that gets in your bloodstream. It will go everywhere. And you'll start thinking about it. And then your heart will be moved towards that. And you'll start saying, well, you know, I, maybe God didn't say that. The minute doubt is in your mind, you are in trouble. This is your fortification. The Word of God is a fortification. Do you remember? When Satan was tempting Jesus, when he had 40 days in the wilderness, three times Satan came to Jesus. Three times! And he tried to tempt him. I think it's in Matthew. Three times he tried to tempt him. And three times Jesus said, get out of here. Look what's happening here. G Matthew chapter 4. I'm just going to read this. Listen to what happened. Jesus knew how to get away from this nonsense that the devil very often traps us in. Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards hungry. And when the tempter came to him, the tempter, of course, the devil. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Okay. But he, Jesus, answered and said this, It's written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Did you hear that? Every word is the Bible. Not the Reader's Digest condensed version. Not some wishy-washy version. Not some pastor that's preaching something that has nothing to do with the Bible. Has nothing to do with conviction or repentance or coming to Christ or asking forgiveness for sins. That kind of stuff comes from Satan. That is how he gets in. Now, let's continue on real quick. Verse 5. Then the devil takes him up into the holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he says, If you are the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it's written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thou foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him again, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus is two for two. Satan tried twice. Jesus came back twice and said, no, 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 no. It's written. It's the word of God. You're not going to put doubt in my mind. You're not going to deny anything. And you are not going to denigrate me in any way. Again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory. And he said to him, all of these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Successful deflection. Devil, hit the road. Take it on the road. Go bug somebody else, Satan. You're not going to get it from me. Jesus is our example. He's our role model. He did not let Satan get a foot in the door. Didn't put doubt in his mind. Didn't deny the word of God. Jesus stood on the word of God. That's what we need to do. Stand on the word of God. So Satan's strategy, his goal, as I said at the beginning, is to take as many of us to hell with him as he wants. If you're having a rough time right now, if you're feeling a little weak in your faith, that's the time to get into the Word. Pray. Seek God. Be part of a Bible-believing church. Be part of a congregation. Reach out for help. Don't let Satan put that first seed of doubt in your mind. Because the minute you do that, your faith is going to go right down. And then he can use these other two strategies. Denial. And then finally, he'll start knocking God down. And then you'll start thinking a lot less of God. Yes, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not going with him either. <laughs> no, no way. I'm sticking with God. But let Jesus be our role model. He quoted the Bible every time the devil came to him. He said, oh no, it's written. It is written. It is written. Right here. It's written. So I call Satan's strategies the three big D's. Doubting, denial, denigration. Don't let that happen to you. Stay away from the three D's. I pray that uh, you've been blessed by this Bible talk. If you have, I would just ask that if you have been blessed, share this video with someone else. This has nothing to do with me. I don't want, I don't need, I don't desire, I don't have to have credit for it. But this is the word of God going forward. And God has said in Isaiah 55, 11, that his word 
will not return void. It will reach those people it needs to reach. So if this has blessed you, if you have felt a connection with this message tonight, if you've enjoyed this Bible talk, share it with someone else. Share it with someone who's struggling. Share it with someone who needs to hear the Word of God and be uplifted. Maybe you know someone right now that, that Satan just has in his grips and they need to be released. The Word of God will do that. And so I thank you for sharing this time with me on Bible Talk. Lord willing, next Thursday night and every Thursday night, we will be here for another edition of Bible Talk. Uh, and until we see each other again, thanks for watching and God bless you.